Okay, well, good morning, everyone. So we are finishing off our series uh, this in, for the last four weeks on suffering and crying out to God. So let's pray as we begin. Dear Lord, as we look at Psalm 3 this morning, that you might speak clearly through me, that you might help us to apply what we learn to our lives, that we will be coming close, being drawn closer to you, Lord, through uh, this Psalm of David. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Christians, we suffer. Things go wrong. And depending on what it is, it may have lasting consequences. Suffering, as we know, doesn't go away. Suffering is not over quickly. Suffering can take its time with us. And although God has the power to take away our earthly suffering, he rarely does. And to be fair, that's because... and Actually, to be fair, there's nowhere in the Bible where God has actually promised that he will alleviate us now from our earthly sufferings. And so, at least for now, on this side of heaven, we're stuck with our present sufferings. And so we have to live with suffering, don't we? We have to learn to live with it. And suffering, it does make life messy. It makes life complicated and it makes it difficult. Suffering is something, as Christians, we can't get rid of, but we must know how to cope with it. But that's the question this morning from Psalm 3 that we're going to get answered is, how should we cope with our suffering? In my experience, some Christians have actually turned away from God and have decided that they're going to find other means of fixing uh, their problem, uh, coping with their suffering. Uh, but sadly, I've seen that kind of end badly because they're, they're temporary uh, quick fixes that they shouldn't be getting into. But in Psalm 3, what we'll see from David is that he will show us how we should cope with our suffering as Christians. And that is, what's the answer to that? And the answer we're going to see is we're to cope with our suffering by leaning upon our relationship with God. Okay, so we are to cope with our suffering through leaning upon our relationship with God. So just to give you a bit of a context as to what's going on in Psalm 3, so David is trying to flee from his son, Absalom. So right now David is king over God's kingdom. He's king. But Absalom, his son, is going to come in and he's going to take over. And unfortunately that was the, the way that royalty worked back then. That was the way kings worked back then. Sadly, it, was, it, was, it could be a very quick succession of people um, coming in, going out. It was very fluid. It, not much security at all. It's a situation where no king would ever want to go through. No one at all. Because it's such a horrible thing to happen. For a king to go from a king to being a slave or to be a fugitive, which is, this is what's happened with David, it's pretty devastating. Very devastating for King David. And so I guess you could say that David, right now, is in a bit of time of suffering. And so as we get into the psalm, I hope you have the psalm open in front of you because we're going to go through it and it might be worthwhile for you to follow along so that you can follow David's thoughts and how it can, you know, if you have a situation, if you are suffering too um, with something, maybe you can uh, apply that as well. You can think through, as a Christian, how do I respond to this? So in verse 1 to 2, David starts to outlay his suffering. He kind of puts it on the table before God. And he's got a lot of pressure that surrounds him right now. So in verse 1, it says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? And so currently what we're seeing is there's an external opposition coming from the outside of the kingdom, coming upon the kingdom. Okay. And so with this external opposition, I think the first people we think of or who I thought of, was Absalom and his followers. They're coming in and they're going to take over the kingdom. And they're not only just trying to take it over, they want David's world to burn and David along with it. They don't care about David. They just care about the power that being a king and being in the royal family gives them. 
So that's all that they care about. So there's this opposition that David has to, has to think about and deal with, that there, he has to flee his kingdom. But there's not only the external problem that David has to deal with. So he, on one side, he's getting hit by this external pressure. But there's other pressures. In verse 2, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. So there's not just external pressure. There's also internal pressure from his own camp that are saying that about their God, that God will not deliver me from what's going on. And so can you see how frustrating this must be for King David? The fact that he's not only got an external problem to deal with, but hitting him from a surprising angle, it's an internal um, struggle as well. People who should be in his camp, who should be worshipping the same God, are now turning their back on God and saying, we don't think he's going to you know, save you. We doubt in him. And that is the word of the moments in God. Doubt. That's what's happening. And so I guess the question is, when we feel like we're suffering, how often do we quickly want to turn to something else or anything else uh, when we're suffering and not go with God? But at the end of verse 2, the question has to be asked. David uh, said the opinion, stated the opinion of uh, his people. He's also stated the external opposition. There's also another opposition, and that's uh, himself. So he's got these two, opposition, these two pressures pushing upon him. But then there's also himself. Like, how is he responding within himself to, to the events that are happening around him? As a king, he's the one that makes the decisions. The buck stops with him. And so he has to make a decision. What's he going to do? How is this going to play out? Because his decision impacts everybody, doesn't it? And so you've got these three pressures that are coming down hard on him. Um, you know, external opposition, God's not going to save you, and oh, what am I going to do about this? So I wonder if you can see all these pressures, this intensity that is going on with King David right now, just in two verses. And so the question we have to ask ourselves right now is how is David going to cope with this? Because his situation is pretty dire. It's pretty horrible. And in verse 3 to 8, we, we do get our answer, don't we? David doesn't turn to other forms of uh, following or he doesn't turn to his friends and he's convinced that God's not going to deliver him. God, he is convinced that, David, that God will deliver him from his suffering. So he leans upon his relationship with God there. And we're going to see that through the way that he speaks. It's amazing what you can learn from people when they speak about something. Do they really know this person? Do they really know what they're talking about? And so, from verse 3, he begins, But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, the one who lifts my head high. So already there's uh, this, this talk of this, this, this shield. Now, in warfare, I know of the shield that goes in front of a person. But then you have to manoeuvre it all the time behind you and those sorts of things. But this shield, it, it's a 360 degree shield. So it's like cutting edge technology. I don't think there's ever been something quite like it. But it's something But I guess what David's saying here is saying that God is his protector. That he's going to protect David from what's happening. But not only that, but that uh, God is his glory as well. So anything that happens with David... Glory is given to God. Anything that he does that people praise him for, no, 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 the praise is given to God. And that's who David is. He actually is in contrast with other leaders that he knows of who were not like that at all. People like, uh, back in the book of Leviticus, you might remember um, Aaron's sons, the priests, Nadab and Abihu, who were meant to be God's leaders in the tribe of Israel. But instead, they corrupted the practices that God gave them and they got punished for it. Uh, other people who were in that situation was Eli. Eli who turned his, uh, his back on what his sons were doing. You know, the, the, the corruption that they were doing. And Eli would just be like, oh no, that's okay. And even his sons were corrupt as well. So you can see that there is this direct contrast, maybe what David is thinking about. You know, God is his glory. You know, David is very submissive here. He doesn't think he can get himself out of this. He knows the only person that can is God. As he keeps listing what uh, God means to him and who God is for him, in verse 4 he keeps going, I call out to the Lord and he answers me. 
from his holy mountain. You see that? God is someone who answers him. And the reason why that God answers him is because God listens to him. And the reason that God listens to him is because God is the true and living God. And so, again, he contrasts God to all these other gods that are false and that don't do that. Lifeless things that are wooden. And so you can imagine what he thinks about. You know, what, what gods are in direct contrast to this God that, that David is talking about? I remember one situation where the presence of God comes into a pagan temple. Um, the Philistines, they bring them in, they bring it in to um, Dagon. The, the, the pagan god of the Philistines. The next morning, the great Dagon, the one made of wood and stone, has been is bowing down before the god of the universe, the true and living god. So this is the god that, that David believes in and is leaning upon to get him out of his situations. Or not only to get him out, but to lead him through the situations. In verse 5, he keeps going. He doesn't stop. He just keeps going, doesn't he? There's no stopping, David. In verse 5, he says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. David is reliant upon God for his very breath. Every step that he takes, he walks on eggshells, knowing that at any point, God could just take his life away. Like that. And that's it. David knows this. He knows God. And I think we can all agree, he knows him very intimately. He knows him very well. And then in verse 6, as a result of what he's said so far, can we see how all this relationship he has, this depth of relationship, means that in his sufferings, he has no fear anymore. The fear has been taken clean away. Clean away. And in the sufferings that we face, wouldn't it be great if we felt like that? If we felt that our fears were taken away, that we didn't have to worry about what's happening, what's coming, because we know that our relationship with God is there and it's secure. We know that our God is the living God. We know he protects us. We know he is, he is with us. And so I guess ultimately we have to think about, well, why is David not fearing here? We've already had a list of things as to why, but ultimately why is David not scared about what's coming? Why doesn't he fear the future? Even though for him it's uncertain as to what's going to happen to him. Is Absalom going to come in and kill him? Is he going to, be, you know, is he going to die of starvation out there in the caves where he flees to? Well, the reason that he's not fearful is because ultimately, above everything that he's already said, in verse 7, he knows that God will save him. So verse 7 says, Arise, O Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Do you see how many um, imperatives that are used there? So imperatives are commands. Um, and he's, I guess he's wanting God to act. Okay? Arise, deliver, strike, break. Now usually you don't ask that of people or of God if you didn't think he couldn't do it so david knows david uh, david knows that god can do this he knows that god can save him and so that's why he says what he says but ultimately it's david's future hope that drives his dependence on god so in verse 8 as it ends the psalm from the lord comes deliverance may your blessing be on your people so at the beginning of verse 8, there it is again. He states God is the only one who can save him. From the Lord. He doesn't say from the Lord and someone else. He doesn't say from the Lord and you know a few people over there. From the Lord comes deliverance. It's very clear. Very straight. And then at the end, it's interesting. He says, may your blessing be on your people. Hmm. And it's interesting because this is actually a blessing, not from his time, but it's from the book of Numbers. So this blessing was given to Moses and the people. David wasn't alive back then. And so it seems that this promise from the book of Numbers is where God's enemies were promised to be scattered and God's people were to be kept. 
It's the promise of never letting his people go. And this is one of those promises that David keeps with him. He remembers in suffering. He, he remembers it. He says it. He meditates on it. You see? He believes that God will save him because he's going to keep him. He's one of God's people. He's going to be kept forever. And so Psalm 3 straight away has, now has a deeper dimension to maybe what we thought of originally. We now have to um, expand our thinking with this psalm. At first, we may have just thought about you know, David Absalom, David Absalom, but now there's kind of a David Absalom, but Absalom's not the big deal anymore. Um, there's, there's, a more, there's more here. There's a blessing here that, that God has promised to save them from other enemies, their enemy of sin and death. And so what this implies then, this relationship with God that David has, is the strength to cope with his present sufferings. He may not be walking through them. He may be getting dragged through the mud, as a lot of us may be able to testify with things that we've gone through in our lives. We may be getting attacked on all sides like David is. But with God, with our relationship, if we lean on him, he can drag us through. He can get us through those sufferings. He may not take them away, but we are to continue to trust, to continue to push forward, that our faith continues to be secure in the one who has our eternal life in his hands. And that's the, so, that's the great thing, isn't it, about David's suffering and about the suffering that we experience, because the relationship that, God, that David had with God is similar to the relationship that we have with God today. Obviously for us it was through Jesus' death and resurrection that we now come through to, to God. Um, however, with David obviously, um, it, Jesus hadn't come on the scene yet and so um, it wasn't quite the same way. However, um, we do see, don't we, that with the cross, because of the cross, we can walk with God. We can have that, um, we can have that confidence in him. And so I guess the question is, how do we then see that happening in our lives? How should we, through David's example, how can we walk with God? Uh, how can we cope with our suffering with God? Well, I think the first thing we have to remember is that we have to continue to remember that our eternity is secure. Not because we have blind faith or because there's no evidence, but we have to keep remembering that God is the true and living God. He is the one that's going to bring us through our sufferings, but ultimately bring us through death and into eternity. He's going to hold us by the hand, walk us through. So that's the first thing I think we can, we can cope with our suffering because of our eternity and what's to come. We do not have to fear death anymore. Second, David remembers God's word in the scriptures. We talked before about uh, things that he may have been thinking about when he's talking about God being his glory. Um, you know, the type of leader that he, he, he is and comparing maybe um, other examples, you know, Dagon, for example. Uh, we talked about that. Eli, Nadab and Abihu, these sorts of people who uh, were in co contrast not quite the same, were they? Very different. Uh, but David remembers ultimately the promise in the book of Numbers. So he's meditating not just on God's word, but on the promises for his life. So he remembers them and they help him endure through his present sufferings. Some, uh, sometimes we might find that we depend on other things, but they will eventually fail. People's word will fail. The only thing that stands firm is God's word. That never fails. Third, and lastly, I don't know if you, can, as we've read through the psalm, you can see how good a relationship he has with, with, with God. How David and God, they're, they're together, right? They're, they're best friends. They, are, they have an intimate relationship. So I guess the question is, you know, is, is that the type of relationship you as a Christian, do you, would you say that is you? Would you say that you know God intimately, that through suffering, you will grow closer to God and not drift further apart? Is that you? Or, do you, or is there other things that you have to revisit in your relationship with God? Because knowing someone really helps you stick to them more, doesn't it? If you don't know people that well, you will grow further away. But if you know them really well, it tends to make you stick together more and this is where things like even simple things like reading the bible is really important praying to god is really important if we invest our time into these activities you know ourselves with other with other christians doing it all the time 
If we are soaked in the Bible and we're soaked in prayer, when we come to times of suffering, we can lean on that relationship with God. We know the Bible that well that we can recite it, we can meditate upon it, and that it will pull us through that suffering. So I guess my challenge to all of us here today, and as I was being challenged when I was reading through Psalm 3 and thinking through what that meant for me, I guess the challenge to all of us is can we resist the temptation to to cope with our suffering and run away from God, but actually to stick with God through the tough times, through our suffering, to bring us through? Is God really who he says he is? We come here every Sunday, we listen to sermons preached, we read the Bible through the week, we hear of God, this God who can help us through our suffering. But do we really believe it when it comes to the crunch? And so keep thinking about that. Keep wanting that experience like David to have no fear. And let's continue to try to lean upon God in our times of suffering. So let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your promise of eternal life for all of those who come to know you. We thank you, Lord, that as a result of that, that what we see in life, the sufferings that we have, that they are but temporary things, that they will dissipate. That ultimately, because of what you have done through your son, Jesus, that we are able to be saved from our sins. And that when we die, we will come into an eternity with you where there is no more suffering, crying or pain. But Lord, as we do live here on earth with suffering, that we have to continue to endure uh, the, the, the devil tempting us when we do fall into temptation when we do get it wrong when we do come back to you and ask for forgiveness Lord please help us to please help us to continue to be thinking through our own lives to continue to be thinking through how we're suffering are we coping with our suffering with you or are we um, getting a fake imitation of, of it instead please be with us all wherever we are with you to continue to strive to invest in our relationship with you so that in our times of suffering we can lean upon you so that we can cope with our suffering rightly. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.